these um, journals, including the Journal of Second Language Writing. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, so I, I'm really happy to uh, be the moderator and to um, present Dr. Ali Al-Huri. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, I assume you can see my slides now, everything okay? Yes, we can, yes. Okay, so let's get started. Um, predatory, predatory publishers, how to increase your chances of publishing in indexed journals. So in this presentation, I will first talk about briefly the history of predatory publishers. Uh, definition, what do we mean when we say uh, predatory publisher? Some things to identify uh, predatory publishers. We have some interesting examples. And then we will have some actual examples of predatory publishers and finally where uh, we are going here. So why, why do we need to identify um, predatory publishers. So what's the problem? Why don't you just go and publish? You know, it's, it's no big deal. The problem is you can publish anything you want, even if it is not based on rigorous science. So somebody will claim, for example, that vaccines have this and have that and publish it in a so-called scientific journal, and then this can cause confusion. If the science is rigorous, then that's OK. But if the science is not rigorous, we have a problem here. We have a lot of confusion. People will not be able to tell which has been peer reviewed and which has not been peer reviewed. So the problem is that these predatory publishers deceive the public by saying that we are peer reviewed, but they are not peer reviewed. Now, peer review itself has some problems, has a lot of discussion about the rigor of the peer review process itself, but these journals deceive people and readers saying that we have peer review, but they actually they don't have peer review. And if we don't have peer review, you can publish anything if you are going to pay for it, which is a problem. So starting with the history. So the history of predatory publishers started with the Internet. This is technically called gold open access journals. And um, and which the where the author pays to publish, which is you know interestingly is the opposite of capitalism. In capitalism, you um, when you have a product, others pay for your product, but here you work on your research for one or two years, and then you also the one who pays so that people can receive this product, which is kind of interesting. So Jeffrey Beale. So Jeffrey Beale retired from the librarian, retired from the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, in around 2008 or just before that, he noticed because that was the time the Internet was becoming popular. He noticed that, you know, there are a lot of, you know, questionable publishers and their number was increasing month after month, not even year after year. So he's coined the term predatory publishers. And he considered that the dark side of open access, just like when you have email, it's much more convenient than snail mail, but you also have spam that you have to deal with. So predatory publishers were like spam for academia. So until 2007, and then the list was shut down. And reportedly it was because of, of a threat from Frontiers. We will come back to this later. It's currently available, the list, but maintained by an academic, an anonymous academic in the UK. So this is Beale's list. It's no longer maintained by Jeffrey Beale, the one who, who um, created this list by, by somebody who is remaining anonymous because of the threats from publishers that Jeffrey Beale received. 
Okay. So currently, according to the, some research, there are more than 8,000 predatory journals. In 2010, they published like more than 50,000 articles. In 2014, it was close to half a million. This is according to 2015. And so you can, you can guess that there is much more now. And the market size is, you know, in the millions. So it's, just, you know, approximately one trillion Saudi reals. So there is a big business out there. That's why there are more and more predatory publishers, because there is a lot of money. People are desperate to publish. So the, this, for this demand, the journals provide, um, try to satisfy this demand. So what is the definition of predatory publishers? So let's see some characteristics. Um, editorial and review board. In predatory publishers, they have a list of big names and Surprisingly, some of these people may not even know that their names was listed in the journal, which is suspicious. Why, you know, you, you, you list somebody's name as an editorial board member without their knowledge. So why to give credibility to um, the journal? The review process, minimal or no review process. Turnaround time, usually it's fast, even weeks or even days and they will get usually, you know, uh, a decision usually accept. Rejection rate accepts no, you know, all submissions basically if the, if the author is willing to pay. Scope, usually because their main interest is to attract as many um, authors as possible, they make the, the, uh, the scope so broad that it covers everything, science, engineering, education, linguistics, etc. This is a sign that the journal may be problematic. Payment, you know, it can range to $300, $500, or as we will see later, you know, it could be over a thousand or 2000, sometimes $3,000. Solicitation, this is very important. They send invitations to others to publish with them. Okay, let's have actual examples. So this is, an actual email that was sent to me. You can see my name here. Maybe it's not too clear, but this email was sent to me. Let's see where is the date. Here is the date, 23rd of September 2020. So around a year ago, from somebody called Carol Maria, the title is Invitation of Submitting Papers and Joining the Editorial Board Reviewer Team. Shared sustained flow. This is the title of one of my papers. Then when you open the email, you see the title of the journal, International Journal of Psychological and Brain Sciences. You see they have ISSN, online and print. They say open access journal, peer reviewing, publish papers in 90 days. So dear Ibrahim Z and Al Huri A. This is my co-author of this paper. Let's read the content of this email. Warmest greetings from the editorial assistant. We get to know your research paper titled Shared Sustained Flow, Triggering, etc., which has been published in ELT Journal, which is true. And the topic of the paper has impressed us a lot. Okay. The paper has attracted attention from scholars specializing in psychological and brain sciences. Interesting. So this is the title of the journal, Psychological and Brain Sciences. Now they say submit your research articles, join as, as one of the editorial board members reviewers on behalf of the editorial board or of the journal. We hope that you can grant us the honor to invite you to join us as the editorial board member reviewer of this journal. Taking into account your academic background or rich experience in this field, we think you are qualified for this position, etc., etc. So when somebody received an e receives an email like this, they may feel flattered. Look, you know, a journal saying that they were impressed by my work and my paper has attracted attention and they are inviting me to join 
their editorial board. Oh, I must be, you know, very famous. So again, you know, I read the, the date of this of this email for a purpose. It was the 23rd of September 2020. Around a month later, in the 18th of October 2020, almost a month afterward, I received another email from Nat Natasha Alexander. Dear Al Huri, publish your paper, become editorial board members, reviewers, share, sustain the flow. Interesting. You know, there is some similarity in the title. International Journal of Education, Culture and Society. That's a different journal. It's a completely different field because, because this journal was psychological <coughs> and brain sciences. This journal is education, culture and society. Completely different. Dear Al Huri, yeah, hello. Warm greetings from the assistant editor. That kind of sounds similar. Your article published in the LT journal, etc., etc., has impressed us a lot. Interesting. It's it's like a copy paste of the previous email. So, did you just copy and paste the content? The paper has attracted attention from researchers and scholars specializing in education, culture, and society. Yes, sir. So again, this is the title of the paper. So you can see that the email was just copy paste and they did not bother to change the, the, the format of the email apart from some basic information. So you can imagine how many tens and hundreds of other researchers received this mass email just to, in the hope that they will submit their papers to the paper and then pay the fees. Again, invitation to cont contribute to your, re your research paper. Become, be the member of the editorial board on behalf of the, of the editorial board of the journal. We feel deeply honored to invite you to join us as the editorial board member. Your academic background and rich experience in, the, is, in this field are highly appreciated, you know, etc., etc. You can see it's basically the same content. So if you receive emails soliciting papers from you, there is a very good chance that these are predatory publishers and they have sent the same email to tens and maybe hundreds of other researchers. So don't let these emails fool you. So what's the definition of a predatory journal? Predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest. So, so what self-interest here means money, really. You know, they want the money. At the expense of scholarship, and are characterized by false or misleading information. They will say oh, we are indexed in this and we are indexed in that, or in reality they may not. Deviation from best editorial and publication practices, which means really peer review, there is no rigorous peer review. Lack of transparency, they say we have peer review, but we don't, so it's misleading. And the use of aggressive, and indiscriminate solicitation practices like the email we saw uh, in the previous slide, aggressive and indiscriminate, they send it to many people at once. So these are major characteristics of predatory publishers. So let's look at some stings, sting one. So this is an actual paper published in a journal called the US China Education Review A. It was in 2020, like, you know, a year ago. Title is Experience, Experiential Learning in Secondary Education Chemistry Courses, a Significant Life Experiences Framework, authored by Bradley Alf and Jesse Pinkman and Walter White. You may notice something strange here because these are actually two characters in a, in a TV show called Breaking Bad, and this is a spoof paper. <coughs> paper. So this guy, Bradley Alf, put their names. You can see in Albuquerque, you know, Wayne High, Wayne High School, Albuquerque in New Mexico. And you can see that hands-on process of manufacturing and distributing methamine, etc. So what's the story behind this strange paper? So what happened was that somebody called Bradley, Bradley Alf, PhD students at North Carolina State University. One day he received an email invitation like the, the emails I showed you previously from this journal. 
So he, he wrote up a spoof paper and he wanted to test whether the spoof pa the paper will be accepted by these people or not. And he used Breaking Bad characters as a joke. It was accepted within a few weeks and asked them to pay, you know, $500, which is, you know, about 2,000 riyals. And if we look at the actual paper, you know, we use the one-tailed dog's exact test. There is no dog's test. This is, this is a joke. What do you mean a dog's test? All analyses were performed in MS Paint. What do you mean you did the analysis in paint? Just, just to be clear, let me show you paint. This is paint, Microsoft Word. So it's for painting. What do you mean when you say you did the analyses in paint? That doesn't make any sense. Any reviewer reading this sentence will say, wait, something, how do you do the analyses in paint? So, so, but it was accepted. And in the acknowledgement, in the acknowledgement, they say, you know, it's, it's a big joke. They say they didn't even get IRB. I mean, seriously, what could possibly go wrong, you know? And uh, and they put the, the author's names, and this is professor, diploma, assistant professor. How can somebody, you know, regardless of their name, get a diploma and then become an assistant professor? If we look at the table, you see, you know, chemistry knowledge, business knowledge, a dime of crystal cells for how much? Communication skills, you need to resolve a conflict with your business partner, what might be some effective strategies for negotiation. They say, I have the data, but, you know, no promises. I, I can't, you know, promise to give you the data and supplementary material. We see also that because the authors lacked the statistical knowledge or background or motivation to conduct more rigorous or and the proper evaluations of the data. You see anybody reading this paper closely, if that person is a peer reviewer, they will say this is a joke. It's not real. Abilities in narcotics synthesis, drug distribution, network learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is, you know, presumably their the Jesse Pinkman's, you know, knowledge before and after the intervention. So, um, so the paper accepted, the journal accepted that paper. Let's see another example. You know, somebody might say, well, you know, maybe the reviewer wasn't careful and didn't pay close attention. It looked okay. It looked professional with all these graphs and with and is these tables. Um, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. So let's have another example. So the title of this paper is Get Me Off Your Mailing List. And then the abstract is just copy paste the same sentence, the introduction. It goes on and on for the whole paper. Let me show you the whole paper. This is the paper. And it goes on the whole paper like this until the references. Nothing, it's just nothing, just the same. So you can't miss it. If you miss the first one, how can you miss this, this paper? And do you think this paper should be accepted? Is there a chance that this paper will be accepted? So what's the story behind this paper? 2015, two people, somebody from Stanford and... Um, uh, something is not... Anyway, so in 2015, computer two computer scientists, one from Stanford and Harvard, uh, so people who, you know, created this as a joke. In 2014, somebody from Australia received uh, an invitation email from the International Journal of Advanced Computer Technology. So he submitted this paper and it was accepted and they sent him a receipt for a fee of, you know, around 500 Saudi Riyals. 
So how could you accept this paper? If we look at the graphs in this paper, how could you miss this? Even this, you know, how could you miss this? OK, so we are beyond the stage of you want money, but at least you should open the document and read it before you accept it, right? That's the least you could do. Even the surprising more, you know, this is actually the, the re re review form. So paper ID, yes, and am. Paper title, yeah. you didn't notice something wrong when you copy pasted the title here. Appropriateness, excellent. Yes, I am. And something is, is not showing here, let me. So I'm trying to show this. I'm not sure why it's not showing, but here you can see your manuscript has been accepted with minor changes for publication. So they, they did require some minor changes. Surprise, surprise. And they actually require two minor changes to this paper, ironically. The first was they the first was they said that the abstract was short. We need more in the in the abstract. So you notice the size of the abstract, but not the content of the abstract. And the second um, revision they, they requested was they said, oh, we need more re references that are also recent because you just have two references here. So let's continue. Sting three. So the past two sting, st stings, they they weren't considered research per se. You cannot say that I did research using, you know, that paper and I can now generalize my results to all journals, open access journals out there that are predatory. You know, it was just a joke. So some researchers said, OK, let's do an actual study. So who is afraid of the peer review. This paper was published in Nature. Um, you can maybe you can see a spoof paper concocted by science reveals little or no scrutiny at many open access journals. So sorry, this is in science, not, not Nature. So what's the story behind um, this journal? So. Previous things were not researched, so somebody called John Bannon collaborated with science to conduct this study. So he wrote a, a fake paper uh, full of methodological, clear methodological mistakes, and he sent it to a number of journals. And, you know, all, close to 160 journals accepted it. Now what, you know, in, in some journals, this is the critical part. In some journals, in some journals, the review was superficial. So they pretend to have peer review, but they don't look at the content. They say, OK, we want the font to be 12 Roman times. We want the formatting to be like this. You know, that, like we said in the previous example, uh, the abstract was short. We need more references. We, but that's not the only thing you do when you peer review a paper. You need to look at the content also. This is another important point. Some journals sent the paper to actual reviewers who were experts in their field, and these reviewers came back with damning reviews. So what John Bannon did in this study, he pretended to address these, these uh, comments and send the journal back to the journal as is. Now, the journal should reject the paper because they said you didn't fix the problems that the reviewers pointed out but they accepted the paper. This shows that they state on their website they, they have peer review and they actually do send their paper to peer reviewers, genuine peer reviewers, but they, they don't take into account the content of the peer reviewers provide. So what's the point? So this is misleading also. So the interesting thing is that some of these journals were published by 
prestigious publishers like Elsevier and Sage, and the Sage Journal requested, you know, three thousand dollars, which is equivalent of more than eleven thousand Saudi riyals, to accept that fake paper. Also, interestingly, eighty-two of the accepting journals were in Beale's list, which gives some credibility to Beale's list. Uh, uh, rationale for including. Around 50% were listed in the directory of open access journals. This is considered a white list, whereas, you know, Beale's list is a black list. If you are listed in Beale's list, this is a black list, but the directory of open access journals is more like a white list, but still around 50% were from this directory, which shows that the methodology in that list was not you know rigorous one third of the papers were the journals were from india okay so one somebody was from actually a saudi university in that study so what happened was that after the study concluded the the author contacted these journals again and, and said okay this was you know a spoof and you accepted this paper why did you accept it it was full of methodological problems we were actually testing you so somebody a professor of pharmacy at King so so Faisal University in Al-Hassa, his name was Mubin Ahmed, states that, you know, he will shut down the pay, the journal. I'm really sorry for this. So it was a big scandal. And um, some people, you know, sent, you know, still even after telling them that this was, you know, a spoof, you know, they send still saying, oh, if you still want to publish it, just, you know, you change your mind, you know, just let us know. So let's move to the next thing. Predatory journals recruit fake editor. Now, in the past, you know, in the previous things, we were talking about fake papers, but who is the actually the editor and the reviewer? Are there going to be fake reviewers also? So this journal, uh, this paper published in Nature, they did this study. Um, an investigation finds that dozens of academic titles offered Dr. Fraud, a sham unqualified scientist, a place on their editorial board. So these authors ask this question. So how is it difficult to get into the editorial board of these journals? So what they did was that they created a fake person called Anna Suze, which stands for Dr. Freud in Polish, and they created a fake CV. And in that fake CV, the, the, the per that person doesn't even have any peer-reviewed article or citations or experience as a reviewer, let alone an editor. So they wanted to see whether this person will be accepted as a... Uh, as an editor in these journals. And 33% of the journals in Beale's list actually accepted that person as an editor, which means that there is no standards even for editorial board, let alone the journals, which is a big problem. And 0% in, of the papers indexed, of the journals indexed in Web of Science accepted the paper, which is which is what should happen. You know, it's, it's a joke. How can this person with no qualifications request to join the editorial board? So you can see here the figures. So these are quotes from the paper. In many cases, we received positive response within days of application, even within hours. They are desperate. They say, oh, a Polish professor wants to join our, our editorial board. Come on, come on, come in, you know, give us credibility. And immediately appointed her as editor-in-chief, not just an, a member of the editorial board, the editor-in-chief also. Some journals requested payments, so this person is going to help the journal and become a member in the journal, but still requested some fees. Some journals tried to make a deal, you know, 60% you and 40%, or 60% us and 40% you of the revenue if you bring papers. Um, some journals requested that Dr. Seuss actually publish in their journals. 
also for the fee, of course. You see, it's all business. It's just business oriented. They just want to make money. So um, here are act actual replies from these journals. As an editor, you have to publish some of your research articles with the journal. Now, this is a problem. If you are an editor at a journal, you shouldn't publish in that same journal because that's conflict of interest. You know, how can we trust that there was actual peer review? If you want to start a new journal, you will get 30% of the revenue. That it's our pleasure to add your name as our editor in chief for this journal with no responsibilities, just nothing. Just put your name, no responsibilities. You know, this is a big joke. But the journals that rejected this offer, that, that respectable journals, here are examples of their replies. One does not become an editor by sending the C in the CV. These positions are filled by a person who has a high research profile and solid research record, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the, this is, should be the, the right answer in these cases. Okay. So, of course, as usual, after the end of the study, the authors contacted these journals and said, okay, this was a joke. There is no doctor fraud and Dr. Anna Seuss, and we were testing you. How could you accept this person? And even after telling them, at least 11 journals' website still listed her as editor, even afterwards. And even they passed that name to a journal that the authors did not apply to. It's just, you know, they, you know, stealing the name. That's it, basically. So some people ask, why fake data when you can fake a scientist? Is how easy things are in, in predatory publishers. So oh, let's have some examples of actual publishers in order to make the, the uh, situation more concrete. So Omics International. What's Omics International? So it was, it's a, pub a publisher established in 2008 in India. So it owns a large number of journals, over 700, even predatory conferences, yeah, over 3,000 predatory conferences per year. This is how much money they are making. So controversies, they they don't announce that they have publication fees. So you look at the journal's website, they don't they don't mention that there are fees when you publish something. So you send the paper and then, oh, I accepted you pay us now 1000 riyals or 2000 riyals. You say oh, we didn't agree to this. I, do, I don't want to pay this money for any reason. They say, oh, you don't want to pay, then we have withdrawal fees also. And they didn't even mention this on their website. So again, surprising the authors. Uh, not obtaining scholars permission to list them as um, editors. Using fake impact factors to, to deceive authors and no genuine peer review. And they threatened Jeffrey Beal for one billion uh, when he listed them as as predatory in his list. But in 2019, in an unconnected case to Jeffrey Peel, the, the FTC in the United States sued, uh, successfully sued Omics for 50 million. Oh, sorry, this should be million admission. For 50 million uh, dollars. Now, this is a problem because uh, now it's, it's, a court's decision that you are predatory. It's no longer Jeffrey Beale's opinion, no longer people talking online about, it's it's actually official now. You are a predatory publisher by court. So what happened, there is, this has big ramifications. So in Saudi Arabia, some Saudi universities contact, sent an official letter to their faculty saying you have to withdraw your publications from this publisher because it's officially predatory now. So this shows you the, the future ramifications of publishing in these journals because you never know what can happen in the future. So let's have an example. So this was, uh, this is from The Guardian. So somebody from, a professor from New Zealand received uh, an invitation to a conference by Omics. So what he did was that he used 
you know, when you use the autocomplete on your iPhone, he used the autocomplete to just write a fake paper, just whatever the the next word comes comes up to you, just you know, type it in. So, uh, atomic energy will have been made available to a single source. It has no meaning, you know, it has no meaning. So this is the abstract. It's very small, so I will read the first sentence to, to show you that it's it's nonsense, nothing really. Atomic physics and I shall not have the same problem with a separate section for a very long, long way. Nuclear weapons will not have to come out the same day after a long time of the year. He added the two sides will have the two leaders to take the same way to bring up their long ways of this. It's meaningless, nothing, it's autocomplete. So he sent it to the conference. The paper was accepted. Okay, okay, pay us now 4,000 reals. See, they just, they are just after the money. In another example, this paper, Router, a methodology of the typical unification of access points and redundancy. You think that this is a genuine paper, but actually this is a fake paper generated by, compu by a computer. So if we, if I show you the actual paper, you look at it, you think it's an actual paper. But in reality, everything is auto generated with a computer. Many physicists would agree that it, had it not been for congestion control, the evaluation of web, of web browser might never have occurred. In fact, few hackers worldwide would disagree with the essential unification of voice over IP and public private key pair. Now, for you who is somebody not an expert in this field would think, oh, that's an academic paper. I have no idea there are equations and things. But in reality, an expert in this field would know that, that this is nonsense. So these people created this fake paper and it was also accepted for publication. And this person is now actually an, an engineer at Zoom. Um, so this thing also you can see here you think it's a genuine paper but actually it's not there is results and and rel related work experimental results and even references everything here is fake nothing is real okay so this is a, the, the news from Science. U.S. judge ruled deceptive publisher to pay 50 million in damages. But they, they are still, their website is up, omicsonline.org. They say we have open access journals, scientific conferences, scientific alliance. I don't know what this even means. We are an open access publisher, an international conference organizer. organizer. We own and operate more than 700 peer-reviewed clinical, medical, life sciences, engineering, and management journals and host more than 3,000 scholarly conferences per, per year in the fields of clinical, medical, pharmaceutical, life sciences, business, engineering, and technology. Everything, you just do everything. So, omics, so be careful if you see this omics, it's a predatory publisher. Let's have another example. MDPI is becoming more and more popular nowadays. Let's look at what's going on with MDPI. MDPI stands for Multidisciplinary Digital Publishing Institute, MDPI. Founded in the 90s in China, it owns about um, 300 journals. Some of them are indexed in Web of Science and they publish loads, loads of papers. So what are the controversies surrounding MDPI? Uh, critics of MDPI say that its journals has have published pseudoscience research, some of them racist research, some of them anti-COVID vaccines research, which is, you know, not science-based. If science-based, then that's okay, but not science-based. Superficial peer review, as we saw previously, and this led to mass resignations of editors in, in MDPI journals uh, in protest. But still, on the other hand, it did not fall for the John Bannon sting, which we mentioned previously. And Jeffrey Beale added it first and then um, removed it. 
So is this M is MDPI a predatory publisher? The question officially, no, it's not officially a predatory publisher, but there are some controversies. Some people pointed out questionable practices. So if you are considering publishing in M any MDPI journal, the least you should do is look at these controversies, familiarize yourself with them, and then make an informed decision whether this journal, the, the MDPI journal you want to publish you in is for you or not, especially since they charge really high fees like 7,000 riyals and 8,000 riyals. So the least you should do is to look at the controversy behind this publisher. And uh, this is uh, an example of um, an article about it. So let's move to another example, Frontiers. Frontiers is a very famous uh, publisher. Let's look at some controversies behind Frontiers. This is the beginning of the story. 2015, Jeffrey Beale tweeted saying that he added Frontiers to his list. And then the whole thing, the whole hell broke loose at that point. So this guy, Neuroskeptic, he is popular in Twitter. He said, you know, he criticized this move. Look at this 19, 19th of October, just one day after, after Jeffrey Beale's announcement. But then, just two months ago, around two months ago, the same person, the quality of Frontiers has declined. In 2015, you see here, I defended Frontiers, but things have got worse. So things change, you know, journals are not fixed entities. If it's a good journal, it will stay a good journal for, you know, a century or something. Things change. You have to keep up with the latest changes. So some people started to be skeptical about Frontiers. Again, Somebody called Daniel Lakens from, from the, the Netherlands. Again, 19th of October, see the same day after Jeffrey Beale's announcement, he criticized this move to, to consider uh, Frontiers as a predatory publisher. So I sent him an email around two months ago, and I said, look, you know, you defended Frontiers in 2015. Has your opinion changed? His reply was, I liked Frontiers around 2013. Now I'm not enthusiastic, you know, things are changing. So what's the story behind Frontiers? So it was founded in 2007 in Switzerland. Uh, it has high publication fees around 11,000 Saudi riyals, which is very expensive per paper. This is per paper, you see how expensive it is. So Jeffrey Beale added it to his list. Controversies, high acceptance rate. Reportedly, it accepts like 90% of submissions. They don't announce this on, on their journals, but that's what people, uh, estimation, observers of estimation of acceptance rate, which is too high, you know, especially for somebody charging 11,000 Saudi riyals. Another controversy is that even the editors do not have a reject button in the system. They cannot reject papers even if it's bad quality, which is a problem. So you, it's kind of effectively forcing um, editors to find a way to accept papers, including low quality papers, in order to pay this fee. So this is one of the controversies. Editors may be sacked if the rejection rate goes up because the editor can reject a paper at the very beginning before sending it for peer review. Uh, the editor may be sacked if they use this uh, technique. Mass sacking of editors also who objected. Uh, they are required independence without interference from the publisher. They were sacked. So again, the question is, is Frontiers a predatory publisher? The question is officially no. It's not, it's not like Omics, for example. It's not officially a predatory publisher. Many people have pointed out some questionable practices and some controversies. So if you are planning to publish in a Frontiers journal, the least you can do again 
is to look at these controversies, study them, and then make an informed decision whether you would like to publish in a frontiers journal or not. This is the least you should do. So these examples, the, the slides will be available if, on ResearchGate if you want to look up these references to read more. As you can see here, this is also a news article from Science, Open Access Publisher Sachs, 31 editors at once over independence. These editors want to ask the, the, uh, the administrators at Frontiers not to interfere in their decision to accept or reject because there is constant interference on the side of accepting. So they wrote a manifesto and everything about this. It was a big scandal at, at one point. This was in, in 2015, you see here. Okay, is Frontiers a potential predatory publisher? Again, this is another article, as you can see here. From a reviewer point, there is no opportunity to reject a paper, only to endorse or ask for further revisions. And this is one of the controversies. So why garbage science gets published? So this is the reference for the 90%. If you want to look it up, they say that it's around 90% acceptance rate. An editor sacked for rejection rate. She was sacked by Frontiers because she rejected too many papers for being of insufficient scientific quality. So this is part of the controversies. Also, they even um, go and request that authors' cri uh, papers criticizing them be retracted. As one case happened, you can see also in September 2021, so it's very recent. Um, they successfully uh, asked Springer Nature to retract paper considering them a predatory publisher. So some, some people said, you know, why don't you open it for a conversation among academics? Why do you resort to retraction? That's very harsh. Especially since in the same journal, in the same issue, another very similar paper that was not retracted, presumably because um, they didn't consider Frontiers a predatory publisher, even though they used very similar methodology. So what should you do? Uh, you know. Of course, you know, don't publish in predatory publishers. Be careful. Look at um, the journal, study the journal. You may think that it, another publication will help your CV, but in reality, it will not help your CV. And it may negatively affect your employability. If employers see that you have published in predatory publishers, then they will say, oh, you are one of these people who publish in predatory publishers. Don't cite them. This is another important thing. You know, some people, when they want to write their literature review, they go to Google Scholar and type in the keywords that, of their um, focus, and then they cite everything they see. You know, this is my literature review, just citation stuffing. You shouldn't do this. If you want to cite something, you first need to read that paper, obviously. And not only the content of the paper, but where it was published also. If, it's, it, if it was published in predatory publisher, then, it, then it's better to avoid that, citing that paper. Because it will reflect negatively on your credibility when you submit your paper to a genuine journal. Reviewers will say, why are you citing these questionable journals? Even I would say, don't even waste your time reading from predatory publisher because the content is low, the quality of the content is low, the language is low, especially if you are, if English is not your first language, the, the, style, the low quality style they use may influence your own style. So it's better to focus reading on uh, reputable journals. So these are, this is a list of resources. As I said, the, the slides will be available on ResearchGate if you would like to, to follow up on these references. These are helpful to identify and avoid um, predatory publishers. The last item here is, is journal evaluation tool. There is a tool here that 
that if you want to evaluate a journal, it gives you a quick guide to to evaluate it based on the, the journal name, the, the editorial board, the conflicts of interest, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that you can make a decision for yourself whether this is a genuine journal or you know maybe questionable. It gives you a score at the end that um, uh, evaluates this journal. So finally, some people say that uh, predatory publishers is a problem of information literacy. The internet, the age of the internet is relatively uh, recent, just in the past um, maybe two decades or something we have we have had the internet. And so we are still trying to navigate the immense information that the in that came with the internet so it's a problem of information literacy how to identify genuine from non-genuine or fake journals so some people what they do is they go to for example scopus because it's free and open access they look at the, the list of journals there see the q1 q2 q3 q4 and then pick a journal that looks the title looks relevant to them. This is not a good way to look for a journal to publish your research. It's not a good way, I emphasize. This is kind of an uh, amateurish way to do research and to try to publish your work. Because the journals that you should publish in should be the journals that you have cited in your paper. Because a paper is a dialogue in your field. And you are contributing to the science in your field. So you should aim to publish your research in the same journals that you based your literature review on. These journals may be very prestigious and therefore very hard to get in. Yes, this, this can be the case, it could be a problem, but then you go down step by step if you, if you are rejected from top journals until you, you get published. You shouldn't start from below, you should start from up. And these are the references. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, uh, we still have a bit of time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's, I was, I was, it was a really great really presentation. Great. And um, we're opening the floor for questions if anybody wants to You can take the mic if you would like, or you could um, or write it in the chat. Um, but in the meanwhile, I, I myself have a question, Dr. Ali. Um, you touched upon this at the end, but uh, this is one of the things you know, I personally struggle with, and I think um, a lot of my colleagues do as well, is that um, Rejection. I mean, it's it's just uh, how long, on average, and how many times should you try to, um, uh, you know, uh, submit papers? Okay, so the general strategy that people uh, use is that. First, rejection is part and parcel of academia. This is one of the major differences between your student life and your academic life. As a student, most stud most other students in your class will pass the course. That, that's just normal. But in academia, it's the opposite. Most papers get rejected and many people get confused here. Why is, I am a good student, I graduated with honors and with high GPA and doing and working hard and then I rejected suddenly I'm from a bright student to a failed researcher so many people struggle to to understand this but in reality everybody experiences the same situation so the strategy that people follow is that they they make a list of journals and see which which is the highest journal that might accept um their paper and then 
they submit to that paper, to the, the paper to that journal, and then go, they have plan B, they have a list of journals, not just this journal, not just one journal, then go to plan C, then plan D, they go down the list of journals. If you follow this strategy, rejection would mean that you go to the next journal, basically. So some journals do not waste your time. In, in a week or two, they, you get a, what they call a desk rejection, which means the editor looks at the paper and says, sorry, this is, um, we are unable to accept this paper because of its scope, because of its methodology, because of whatever. This is actually good news for you because you can now go and submit it to another journal. You have not wasted your time. Yeah, so an important thing is expect rejection and make a list of journals that you want to submit to. That, that's very important. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz? Thank you, Dr. Ali, for this wonderful presentation about uh, predatory journals. It's really, really informative uh, about how we select the appropriate journal for publishing, especially for faculty members at a university. Um, uh, you know, one of the important things here we, we would like, you know, you to talk about um, is basically how to select the right journal. Uh, we have a lot of resources and uh, in the internet. Um, uh, we are advised to, to go to Scobit and the Web of Science, and although, uh, as you said, there are some problem about that. Um, so what is your recommendation uh, about how to select the right journals, um, uh, you know, for publishing, uh, let's say, an original research paper? Okay, so it, it helps here to consider your paper, as I said, as a dialogue or continuing the dialogue in your field. So it is very important to indicate very clearly how your paper builds on existing literature, especially in that journal, if possible. So that journal has published, you know, something about this topic here and there and there. Then you make it clear to the editors and to the reviewers that you are part of this dialogue. You are not, you know, talking about something less relevant to the journal. This is the first step. And the second step is, you know, be persistent. You know, you may get rejected, go and try next. You have to be very patient in academia, very patient. It's it's normal for a paper to take a year or two years before it, get, it gets published. This is very normal. You have to keep this in mind. The, part of the problem is unrealistic expectations that some people have. They think they would write a paper, and by the end of the semester, it will be published. But in reality, it may take a year or two. This is normal. I think it's the average, like a year and a half or something, for a paper to be published. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for this. I, I would say this is really, really a long time for publishing, uh, you know, giving, you know, uh, the limited time you have, uh, the limited resources you have, and also the also the teaching learn. So I, I, I would I would think that probably uh, over like one year is probably a the waste of time for our, for faculty members to really to, to think about publishing. Um, so that's why we are you know really looking at uh, ways of. Uh, Publishing and a kind of uh, yes, we can have a conversation. We can look at the paper. We can we can talk about it. We can really we can really improve it. But at the same time, we don't want to waste our time just waiting for the you know the mighty decision from the editor. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Another another th thing that might be helpful here, a strategy that I also use myself, is don't be a single paper researcher don't work on a single project at a time. Be part of a team and work on four or five papers simultaneously. So personally, at any single point in time, I work on between five and 10 papers with different teams at the same time. 
So if one paper gets delayed or rejected, or we have any other problem with that paper, we have lots of other papers as backup. So you at the beginning, you may wait for one or two years because all these papers are in preparation, but afterwards, the papers will start to get published one after the other. This is very important. Thank you, Allah, Dr. I really appreciate it. Thank you for, for, for coming to us in King Saudi University of Health Sciences. And also, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Iman for doing this wonderful job uh, of, you know, uh, invitation and collaboration with you. Thank you a lot, Dr. Al. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Aziz. Um, Ms. Maryam, you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Al-Huri, for your uh, presentation. Um, I just have a question. Um, how can we stop them? I mean, I find um, a conference, uh, uh, the name of the, the one who hosting them are Wasit, and it's um, distributed with a famous account on Twitter. So I just said um, I don't advise uh, uh, attending this conference. Sometimes, uh, as what you said, um, these journals or predatory uh, conferences and journals are not uh, officially uh, predatory. But you know that they are predatory because um, you attended a lecture like with someone like you or your supervisor advised you not uh, to attend, but many other people in the, the academia uh, find it uh, appealing. I mean, to be accepted and, um, you know, um, be in a conference and presenting um, like this. So what do you advise? Yes, that, that's an interesting point. As I said in my presentation, when I talked about MDPI and Frontiers, I said they are not officially predatory. And I emphasize this because there could be legal problems in describing them as predatory. They could come after me and say, why are you considering us predatory? On what basis? Even if you publish a paper and you have a hint in this regard, they may go after you and force you to retract that paper, as we saw the example in, in this lecture. So it's, it's a sensitive issue. If you hear rumors about a publisher, you know, they say there is no smoke without fire. Some people try to beat about the bush because of legal issues, because of other concerns with their, with their own institutions, for example. So it's better to go to publishers that, you know, that most people agree upon. If there are questions, you know, and you, uh, you know, be on the safe side. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hafel, do you have a question? Mr. Hafel? Um, okay, Dr. Sajjad? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Dr. Ali, Dr. Iman, Dr. Abdul Aziz, thank you very much for hosting this event. Uh, Dr. Ali, my question to you, it was interesting presentation, but also um, through the presentation, I was thinking to myself, why would scholars be interested, not be even be interested, be pursued to publish in such journals? What push people to go there? Because this journal exists because people are publishing in them. Yeah, any drug exists because people are using it. Uh, this per journal exists because something, somehow, people are pushed toward them. So what do you think could be the psychology behind that? People are publishing or trying to go there. Is it the high rejection rate? Is it the lack of feedback? It, maybe it's the lack of um, publishing training. What is it exactly that is pushing but then also, I mean, in, in recent work I've been doing in a project that we're trying to understand this, but there is, there is, there is lots of things in there, don't you think, Dr. Ali? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. You know, we have a, a pr big problem in academia known as publish or perish. 
people you know are pressured by their institutions to publish and publish and publish and because uh, people feel pressured to publish as soon as possible and these journals offer them quick a quick venue for publication they are kind of enticed to go to these publishers but in reality this academia shouldn't be like this it shouldn't be about metrics and numbers and how many papers you have published it should be about quality because you could have you know let's say for example there are two Saudi universities and in one university they have published say 1000 papers in 2020 and university B published 10,000 papers now it's 10 times more papers published but that doesn't tell us about the quality of the papers right maybe some of the papers in the first university are of much higher quality than the other papers There's, the numbers doesn't tell us so I recommend to you that you read on some literature called slow scholarship. There is a movement in academia called slow scholarship. And in this movement, the advocates uh, suggest that scholars should not aim for paper after paper, but because the faster you do it, the lower the quality. There is always a trade-off between speed and quality. You cannot have top quality and top speed at the same time. It's very difficult. So, but this needs institutional support. You know, if if the institutions keep pressuring their faculty to publish, 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 then you know, and publish a certain amounts of papers to to get promoted. You know, even this this number. You know, it should be based on quality, not quantity. You know. Yeah, look, look up, you know, sco slow scholarship. There is some interesting literature there. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Also, another follow up, just if Dr. Iman may allow me, just um, I, I found that sometime, you know, with the scholars, most of the publication are coming from higher education institution in Saudi, let's say, because we're talking about this current contest, but most of the scholar, when they come from outside, from their wherever they finish their their higher degrees and they come back to education and whatever it is, and they start publishing, they don't you think the lack of having supervision as it's in the West? I've seen it that most of the people when they start publishing, they publish with um, advanced or senior researcher and they take them under their wing and, and slowly and gradually they improve the quality and also the name of their big scholars would add to uh, the um, the acceptance rate of their work and all of that. Don't you think this is something that maybe in Saudi in higher education we need to consider looking to somehow? And this is my final question. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for your patience. Yes, uh, yeah, to put it more bluntly, it's ignorance. Many people are ignorant about you know, predatory publishers and the consequences of predatory publishers. And definitely, yes, it's a good idea to collaborate with established researchers in your field, such as your supervisor, for example, and people. And that's why it's very important to attend conferences in your field. Well-known conferences where big names attend, not just any conference you see. The, the point of attending conferences is not just less listening to lectures there on presentations, because you can find this on YouTube, you can read the actual paper, you know, why listen to this, the author speak about it. But you communicate with these people face to face. Speak with them. Try to collaborate with them see the, late, the latest hot trends in the field because you may be talking about something that's becoming obsolete and you don't know because you are living in Saudi Arabia and most most researchers are say in the West, in the West for example you have no idea that your research topic is becoming obsolete so yes i would suggest that if you want to be a serious academic try to attend conferences well known conferences meet the people that publish in your field talk with them and collaborate with them. It shouldn't be solo work all the way. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Ali and Dr. Sajad. Um, Dr. Haifa? Yes, uh, I would also would like to thank Dr. al Hori again for joining us in this uh, Faculty and Enhancement Committee present one of like our um, presentations and uh, workshops we do here in the caution. So, and actually he raised a very important uh, issue, like which is that equality, okay, the quality of the paper is over the number of publishing. So this is a very significant thing that he raised during his discussion. And also um, there is one of the, I mean, in, in his slides, like when he was presenting, and also, yes, Dr. Al-Huri, when you were presenting, there is one of your slides that showed the um, a, a table that has the characteristics of the good uh, journal. This is like, I think this is a very, very good one, so we can share it. Yes, in, in case if you have it like in a different, like in a separate file, we can share it. Otherwise, we can also like, uh, because we are recording this uh, presentation, I we can do like, I mean, a snapshot or I mean, capture this slide and share it here uh, with everyone. Uh, for those who, I mean, looking for this specific uh, table, so that can help them while, I mean, to look at this table if they decide to publish somewhere. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing whatever you have today and share it with us. And thank you so much for everyone here in this committee and for the attendees for this um, a great uh, lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Haifa. I think that also answers um, uh, uh, Dr. Fahad al uh question, right? Uh, that table would answer your question about uh, what you would look for um, about the journal qualities and uh, practices that would uh, be a red flag. So we will be sharing this PowerPoint um, as Dr. Ali Al-Huri had as generously told us um, earlier that he would be allowing us to do that. Um, uh, and um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Ali, if you have any final words uh, before we end the meeting. Yeah, I, I would like to emphasize that you should <clears throat> you should always try to be in touch with the people in your field and especially well known people in your field through conferences and and otherwise in order to listen to the latest happening because in your field there ma might also be questionable journals you know even if they if even if they fall under well known publisher not predatory publishers like even sage or elsevier or in every field there are black sheep journals that people talk about in private saying that journal is not good or that journal is is, and you never know what could happen in the future. This journal could be excluded from indexing at some point because of the quality of its papers. So stay in touch with, with people in your, in your spe specific field and listen to what people say. Uh, Dr. Ali, but the fact that um, you recommend that we stay in touch, that's not always an option because a lot of people, you know, it's, it's very difficult to stay in touch. But I think that... Um, with social media, we can, to a certain degree, keep up with what's going on. Uh, there are Twitter lists for specific topics under applied linguistics, and also um, there's the Saudi TESOL Association, um, and uh, the the major names, I think, Dr. Ali, in in uh, in all the uh, branches of applied linguistics and other fields um, all have profiles on ResearchGate where we could follow them, right? You don't really have to be in touch personally with, with a specific person in order to keep up with your specific field, right? Because that would be yes, very... And, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, and uh, on, on Facebook, for example, there is a group uh, <laughs> called... Uh, uh, something like research methods for applied linguistics or something. It's very popular for applying linguistics specifically, if that's your field. Uh, 
and you keep up with the with the updates there if you are interested. Uh, is there anything else besides that page, Research Methods for Applied Linguists in, on Facebook? Anything else that you might recommend? Yeah, there, there are smaller groups, more specific groups about TESOL, about different sub areas, but that's the biggest one that I am aware of. So when you go there, you will start to see ones, you know, connected to it and people that are signed up to other ones also. It will lead you to other ones also. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. I am, um, you know, I, I really don't have words for how beneficial this, this presentation was. Um, I think personally, I learned a lot and um, and I've been following your work for quite a while. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that you took the time to, um, you know, let us know about predatory journals and how, how to get um, published and have patience enough to get published. Thank you so much. Thank you to you and to King Saud University for Health Sciences for having me. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. You are welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.